fascinated in the subject of uh, ancient Sumeria um, probably about uh, 10 years ago now um, and the reason I was interested in this subject is I stumbled across it by accident when I was searching for answers as we all are we're all looking for answers things that didn't make sense when we were younger for example when I was at school in religious education they told me the story of Adam and Eve and I said okay that's great but what happened after Cain killed Abel how did that how did the people populate from there? You know, did, did, did they have a door? Did the father, you know, uh, sleep with the daughter or, you know, the son? Anyway, I got thrown out of the class for asking that question. <laughs> <laughs> but it just didn't make any sense to me. I needed to make sense of it. And then, again, same class again, they've been talking about heaven and hell. And, and then I put my hand up and I said, so um, it's Lucifer that runs hell, yes. Uh, so I asked, why is the bad guy punishing the bad? It didn't make any sense to me. Surely the good punish the bad, not the bad punish the bad. So that, that sort of fell flat on its face for me as well. And then obviously you're sort of left in limbo because you, you, you try and make sense of things and it's just not, the information you've been given just doesn't make sense. So I carried on looking. And I stumbled across uh, the Sumerian culture when I went to the British Museum and I saw these things that looked like the Sphinx. And I was like, what are these? And I looked into it, then I found out this civilization predated the Egyptian civilization. So <clears throat> it sort of stemmed from there and it's just grown and grown and grown. And like I say, every every six, seven months or I I get more and more information coming in, more and more information is available. So starting here, this is the Sumerian flood story, uh, which is basically the story of Noah. And the tablet is here. This is a this is a replica of the actual tablet. Yeah, and it, it tells you exactly the same what you what you read in the Bible. Same thing, same story, except the guy was called Zeusudra instead of Noah. And so we'll get started. If you can press the video. of history that won't be denied. The truth is going to come out, and when it does, it's going to be explosive. So once we get that out, we will go back and completely reassemble the 20th century, rewrite it in a way, uh, and may have to go back and rewrite a significant portion of the entire last 12,000 years. This is the greatest story in human history. And the reason it is the greatest story in human history, it is the greatest story of human history. So we, we owe all the uh, translations of the Sumerian uh, cuneiform script to this To this man here, Zachariah Zichin, who spent his whole life, uh, you know, dedicated to finding out the truth. And again, one of his uh, protégés, Lloyd Pye, sadly both of them are not with us today anymore, but they both contributed so much to finding out the truth. Uh, uh, Lloyd, especially recently, with all the genetic stuff that he's, that he's found out. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a shame they're not with us anymore. And this is, this is what I use. I always remember one of my favourite 
writers with Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and his fictional character Sherlock Holmes. Um, there's a great saying, once you eliminate the impossible, whatever remains, no matter how improbable, must be the truth. Now I try and go by that. Um, scientists will go by this, Occam's razor. And that means the simplest answer is always the real answer. But that's not true. It's not always the real answer, the simplest answer. So these are the clay tablets here. They look like... Where's the other one on? <laughs> <laughs> so they're about this size, and double-sided, writing on both sides. They are over 50,000 of them, and they're all hidden away, hidden away from mankind. So what we get from the Zumerian culture is we get the world's first writing. They're baked until hard as rock. A half a million of them exist. Only 20% have been translated. So that 20% has given us so much information already. What's the other 80% going to tell us? It's, it's, it's going to be fascinating the next 10 years when we find out what, what that 80% tells us. They predate the Bible by 4,000 years. That's conservative data. The Sumerians say they've been here for 450,000 years. Um, and that sort of kind of makes sense when you look at all the old monuments that no one knows anything about. If they were as recent as 6,000 years old, it would be written down in quite a few places who built these. But because they're a lot, lot older, that information's been lost over time. Video? Just click the um, image. Northern Iraq, 1849. On the eastern bank of the Tigris River, near the city of Mosul, a team of archaeologists from the British Museum discovers thousands of clay tablets containing cuneiform script they believe to have been written by Babylonian priests in the 7th century BC. Among the tablets found were two mysterious relics that have become known as the Babylonian Star Catalogs. According to translations of the ancient text, these tablets describe the precise movements of various celestial bodies, now known as the Zodiac. We know so much about the history of Babylonia because of the, the excavation and deciphering of huge numbers of these cuneiform texts. And these are, this is the place where they, they discover them, hidden underground, there's vaults like this. Sorry, I keep pushing the wrong button, I'm looking for the laser pointer. And they sort of lie here, these little chambers, hundreds and thousands of them, all un, un, underground. And it, this is actually a photo from uh, the library of uh, Ashurbanipal, which is, which is in northern Iraq. So here you have a... Uh, a, a look at the different types of clay tablets, what they found. Some of them are done it again, so sorry. Some are broken <coughs> off, so obviously we can't translate a whole lot, the whole of it. Um, some are in uh, full, so we, we pretty much got most of it translated. The first everything is true from the Anunnaki according to the Zumerians. Mm -hmm. The first schools, the first writing. The first mathematics, they use a sexagesimal system, which is based on the number 60. Um, it's really good for working out very, very large numbers and very, very small numbers. And it's actually what NASA used today to, to plot courses in, in space. And it, it, it would be the mathematical system you would need to use to plot uh, or chart your way across the universe. The first laws, um, I showed you the law tablet earlier, this is it right here. This is a common law tablet. The first civilization, that's true. <coughs> and it's what Zacharias Zixion said um, when scholars assumed that the Sumerian writings were just myth, um, Zacharias Zixion <coughs> said, Where does the first civilization get a myth from? Um, which is true. Where would they get a myth from? Um, the first agriculture, plough, irrigation, the wheel, the arch, the pulley, 
um, the first alphabet. They over 400 characters um, compared to around 26. More importantly, the first pre-ships. The Sumerians put in place pre-ships. So people of importance, and it's grown from there. The first kingships, this is where we get the royal families from all over the world. The Sumerians put these into place, or to, to say more accurately, the Anunnaki gave the Sumerians this knowledge and put it into place. Slavery and servants, this began with the Anunnaki as well. They enslaved mankind and had them serving them. Money and trading began there as well, and the Anunnaki often married or got involved with the human slave women. This is Carl Sagan. He was a very well-known scientist, and you need to take a note when a scientist like this says something, um, but he's kind of sitting on the fence about it because he doesn't want to lose his reputation. And he wrote in his book, and I feel that the Sumerian civilization is depicted by the descendants of the Sumerians themselves to be of non-human origin. The relevant legends should be examined carefully. And you have to ask yourself, why would someone like that say that? There's obviously a lot to it if you've got a scientist like him. And, and what gives it away even more is when Carl Sagan launched the Voyager 1 and 2 deep space probes, launched by NASA August 19th and September 5th, 1977, they had the languages of every nation on this disc. And they also had one more. They had Sumerian on there as well, which is a language no one uses today. So you have to ask yourself, why would you put that language on there, along with all the other languages in the world, on this gold disc? And they made this gold disc in case it's discovered by another civilization one day. <coughs> so we've got the battle here, creationism v Darwinism. And, and then you have intervention. Um, this, this, is why I, this is why I stand for intervention. I think humankind's been interfered with somewhere along the line, and, and this is how we come to be. Darwinists would say that we evolved from a common ancestor, and creationists say that we just we were created by God and just sort of popped up here. So three major religions founded by who? Judaism. Anyone know who that was founded by? No? Christianity? Islam. All these religions are founded by one person, Abraham. Abraham first, then Moses. Abraham, Jesus, Constantine, Islam, Abraham, Muhammad. Abraham brought the knowledge of the Sumerians, and he was from Ur, which is northern Iraq, which is modern day Baghdad. He brought that knowledge with him and passed it down. So you have the oldest religion here, which is Judaism. Um, Christianity is an offshoot of Judaism, and Islam is an offshoot of Judaism as well. This is Abraham of Ur, built by the Anunnaki, and thought to have been a myth. Ur was first found and excavated in 1953 and 1954 by British consul J.E. Taylor who uncovered the then sand covered remains of the famed ziggurat. And you can see here, this is uh, Abraham. This is where he, he worked, which is modern day Baghdad. He made his way to Egypt. This is the grand ziggurat. This is not what it looked like. This has been renovated by Saddam Hussein. And you can see the American uh, coalition forces. They, they've been there for 10, 15 years. They're, they're, they're not leaving anytime soon. Um, they're there for a while. This is the Kaaba stone. This was built by Abraham of Ur. So this is the holy place of worship for Islam in Mecca. Um, and not a lot of um, Muslims know this, but this, this was actually built by, by Abraham. And it didn't always look like this. This was a rectangle and not a square further back. And it was multicolored as well. It wasn't black. Um, so it's been renovated and redone over the years. The Temple Mount. 
the holy place of the world's three religions. This is a, an ancient sort of uh, platform which you, which you were built with huge, huge stones. Um, and then obviously the mosque has been built straight on top of that. But this is where the, uh, the Templar Knights dug underneath here as well. So, all roads lead to Zuma. The knowledge of ancient Zuma was carried into Egypt by Abraham from Ur to build the great dynasties there. Moses carried this knowledge to Palestine where it was stored in Solomon's temple. This was the genesis of the Kabbalistic and esoteric knowledge. And here's the family tree of Abraham. Sorry, from Adam. Adam and Eve, Adamu in Sumerian means first man. So here, first man. And if you look, here's Enoch, which is the book of Enoch, which has been left out of the Bible. Um, Noah, you can see the, the family tree down here to Abraham. Um, you go further down here, it's Isaac here. King David, which is where our royal family claim their descendancy comes from. Um, and here's Solomon and here's the Prophet Muhammad and you can see everything goes back to one source here right here and this is the creation of man here and the creation of man is the uh, Dhamu which the Sumerians say so the word Adam is taken from the word Adamu and that means first man So, does <coughs> <coughs> the Templars bring Sumerian knowledge to Europe. The Sumerian word for royal blood is Graal. Sound familiar? Sounds like Graal. This is where you get it from. The Holy Graal. After the capture of Jerusalem in 1099, nine French knights led by Hugh de Peons and André de Montbard, uncle of the powerful cleric St. Bernard, traveled to the Holy Land and formed the Knights Templar. As they knew the, re the remainder of Solomon's treasure was buried under the temple in Jerusalem from accounts handed down by their ancestors. Obstensibly, ostensibly a religious order, Templars spent nine years excavating under the temple before returning to France with, with new wealth and knowledge. Solomon's treasure was brought to Europe. So we're on to Charles Darwin now, and not a lot of people know this, but the theory of evolution wasn't actually thought up by Charles Darwin. It was John Baptiste Lamarck, which he came up with 50 years before Darwin. Um, and then the, uh, the theory of evolution by natural selection also wasn't thought by Charles Darwin. It was by Alfred Russell Wallace, and he actually had a paper on the evolution and natural selection, which he handed to Darwin um, and said, if this is worthy of publishing, can you please give it to Charles Lyell, who was the head of the, uh, the, the museum at the time. Um, what they did was they sort of quickly rushed through in what was called the delicate arrangement, um, Darwin and Charles Lyell. They used Lamarck's paper on the natural selection and the theory of evolution, and, uh, and they stuck um, Darwin's name on front of it. So everything's attributed to Darwin because uh, Russell Wallace was from the lower class, really, and Darwin was from the upper class. <coughs> also, a scientist today say the theory of evolution by natural selection is inaccurate because Darwin had no means to gain a clear understanding of the amount of time that had passed since early hominids had, had started to walk upright, began the use of tools, and developed language. This is Bruce Lipton. If anyone doesn't know who he is, look him up. He's a fascinating guy. He's very, very intelligent. He's, he's made some groundbreaking um, discoveries when it comes to genetics and, uh, and, and what happens and how, how, how our body works. For example, he got two petri dishes of healthy cells 
Uh, he put one in a bad environment and he put one in a good environment. The cells in the good environment actually became stronger and flourished. The one in the bad environment started to die. When he swapped them over, exactly the same happened. The good cells started to die in a bad environment and the, the, good, the good cells in a good environment got stronger. And what this actually means is that the environment controls our evolution, how we, how we work. So what Bruce Lipton said was, you take the Darwinian theory, make a scientific principle out of this theory, then you put it into political action, then you have Nazi Germany. This is true. What Darwin theory says, survival of the fittest, it actually condones violence. You know, if, you, if you're saying that you have to be the top person to survive every day, you're always competing with each other. And this is, this is the trouble with mankind, you see it. We've never not had a war since the beginning of mankind. And when we get into this further, you'll understand why. Because we come from a warring race of beings, and it's just been passed down onto us. This is Francis Crick and his partner, James Watson. Sorry, spelling error there. And they discovered the, uh, double, uh, the DNA double helix. Click the video. Francis Crick, the British scientist who helped discover the structure of DNA, believed that human genes could not have evolved by chance. Crick didn't feel in that period of roughly 600 million years from the formation of the planet down to the time when the planet could first support life. There was enough time for DNA to evolve by accident. It's an enormously complicated molecule. Crick gave this analogy. You would be more likely to assemble a fully functioning and flying jumbo jet by passing a hurricane through a junkyard than you would be to assemble the DNA molecule by chance in any kind of primeval soup in five or six hundred million years. It's just not possible. So, not evolution, but adaptation. The word evolution, not actually used by Darwin himself, is pretty vague at best. It should be replaced or used in conjunction with the word adaptation. The theory of ad adaptation is far more fitting for one major reason. For something to evolve, it needs to adapt first. And this, is, and this has to happen fast and in its own lifetime in order for the DNA to be resequenced and passed down. And this is what Bruce Lipton's discovered. Everyone thought that your DNA that you're born with, that's it. It's read only, like on a computer program. But what they've actually found is your DNA is read write. You can you can you can change it co co according to the conditions that you're in. For example, a professional swimmer who spends about eight hours a day in the water, they will put on 30 to 40 percent body fat uh, to make them more buoyant and more streamlined in the water. They will also lose all their body hair. Now. The DNA will remember that, that this, 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 uh, this adaptation has happened. If this woman or this man conceives a child in this time, those, those traits at that moment in time will be passed down to the children. <coughs> this is a, a chart from how the uh, Darwinists think that we came to be a man. And you can see that this is our so supposed um, common ancestor, this is the famous Lucy, um, which they found uh, discovered by Mary Leakey. Um, and this is a human skeleton. You can see quite quite different. The, we have the rib cage here, um, just like a sort of cone shape. Our one's much bigger. The bones, are the, even though they look similar, they're, they're very very different uh, the way they're put together. And what they what they do, the um, Darwinists, is they they get like a human body and they put a head of an ape on it. These don't exist. These are, there's never anything, nothing close to being found to this. It's basically from monkey to man. That's how it is. There is no transition in between. <coughs> you, don't, <coughs> you don't get apes slowly walking upright like that gradually. You either walk upright or you don't. So these don't exist at all. And, and the reason I think 
Darwin, Darwinists is similar to a religion is because they have faith that they're going to find these missing links. Uh, the same as uh, uh, religious people have faith that there is a God and a new Messiah is going to come. So I, I, I think the Darwinists are just as bad as the creationists because they have faith in finding these um, missing, missing links. And to be honest, there would need to be about 30 or 40 missing links to gradually work its way up to humans. Now, <coughs> geneticists have recently found something quite unique to humans, which is these two genes here, the HAR1 and the FOXP2. They don't exist in any type of ape or any type of our human ancestor, which is what they call it. Um, the HAR1 is responsible for our brain size, and it's, it's just popped up in humans 250,000 years ago. That's how far back they can trace it. The FOXP2 gene is responsible for our speech. And like I said, none of, the, none of these guys have it. These two are a fiction. Um, it just popped up in us all of a sudden. So um, what happens is when you have scientists that go against the, the, main, the mainstream that believe in this, which wouldn't be evolution, it, it would be a, a transformation. So they've just transformed an ape into a human, you know, by natural selection or, or by evolution, which doesn't make any sense when you have something that looks like this, that's walked around for eight million years, and then all of a sudden, well, you have a fully functioning modern human. There's no evolution involved there. Uh, click the video. Dr. Virginia Steen McIntyre was commissioned to date a collection of spear points found in Huayatlaco, Mexico. The artifacts were expected to be less than 20,000 years old. But when geological tests pointed to the astonishing age of 250,000 years, Dr. McIntyre was faced with a dilemma. The current theory is that humans have been in the New World, which is North and South America, for 10, 20,000 years, no more than that. Our evidence shows that modern man has been in the New World 250,000 years. And they just cannot accept that theory. It blows their mind. Back in 1973, when we went public with the dates, I was sitting pretty. I had a, a good career going in my specialty, which was volcanic ash studies. I had an international reputation and uh, groups such as NATO and the Amer American Academy of Sciences were paying my way to different meetings abroad to give talks. I had a part-time job with a government agency, one that I thought would lead to better things. I had, later I became a, a professor, or an adjunct professor at one of the state universities in Colorado. And I had a broad um, correspondence with scientists both in the North America and abroad. That's all changed now. <laughs> I ran across one scientist, a European scientist, who was working in the area at the same time. He was a young uh, uh, geologist, set, uh, as I was. And um, he was, I think, probably working on his degree. And he came up to me and said, Ginger, I believe that the dates are, as you say, they are as old as you say, 250,000 years, but my professor will not let me say this. And uh, I understood his position and uh, realized that he would have to um, lie, essentially, about, about his information in order to keep a job. This man uh, uh, published the lie and was accepted and is now a professor in one of the European universities. I published the truth, I w it wasn't accepted, and now I'm doing flowers. So that's just one example of many uh, where you've got a scientist that will go up against the, the, the mainstream and they will lose their job. Now this is something that can't be ignored also, and these are Human footprints, but very big human footprints. They're about two foot in length, but they are identical to a modern human footprint. And they were found in the uh, in some dried up lake beds. This was in uh, in Texas, in a place called Glen Rose. And right next to these footprints, the human footprints, which are very large human footprints, the human would have to be about eight or nine foot tall with these size feet. Uh, there's dinosaur footprints as well, so this gets ignored as well as 
people say it's not possible. There's no way we we live together with dinosaurs because we're only we only go back two hundred thousand years. But you need to think of something else. What if the Zemerians are correct and that we were genetically engineered uh, two hundred and fifty thousand years ago by the Anunnaki, who are the actual original humans um, that are much much bigger than us? Um, and they say they were giants on the earth in those days. You've read that in the, the Bible. And here's proof that there were giants on the earth in those days. And this is not just in one place. They've actually found giant skeletons all over the world. Um, most recently in Romania, they found a load of giant skeletons. That's right, yeah, Daniela? <laughs> so yeah, they found them all over the place. So it's quite interesting, and obviously you can't ignore this, you have to think just because this exists um, doesn't mean you sweep it under the carpet, you have to work out what's happened here. Um, here's another one, um, same place, Glen Rose, Texas, uh, human footprints walking away, dinosaur footprints next to each other here, and you can see how big they are, A very large footprint. Um, Take the video, please. Dr. Bao has uncovered human footprints and a fossilized human finger in the same strata as dinosaur tracks. But even more mysterious is the discovery of an ancient iron hammer whose chemical makeup confounds scientific laboratories. We have a man-made artifact that was found deposited in Central Texas in the very same layer with the dinosaur footprints and the dinosaur remains. It's a man-made hammer with a portion of the handle still intact. Now this hammerhead turns out to be 96.6% iron, 0.74% sulfur, and 2.6% chlorine. Now that's a very exotic blend. I've spoken with a number of physicists, the heads of uh, numerous laboratories, and uh, it's impossible to fabricate that metal today, that is chlorine compounded with iron in metallic form. Now a portion of the handle is coalified. That means there had to be heat and pressure and some time involved in this. You can't make coal, you can't generate coal just by throwing these materials out. There has to be the compression of the entire layer. There has to be the generation of some heat in order to coolify the material, even in a rapid form. If the hammer just fell into a crevice, there is no process that could have coolified a portion of the handle. That means it was placed there at the time the rock hardened and cured. I've had various associates investigate the entire area. I've been over the area numerous times. They found a portion of the bedding plane, the actual layer of rock itself, totally identical to the material of the concretion. Now, dinosaur footprints are found within the immediate vicinity. And then you have layers of rock above this bedding plane that are higher still that do not have dinosaur remains in them. But the material that's consistent with the concretionary material around the implant are all in the lower bedding plane area where the dinosaur remains are. Our evidence uh, is an accumulation of data. We have series of human footprints, isolated footprints, series of dinosaur footprints, isolated dinosaur footprints, a human finger, and a man-made artifact, all found in the same layer this means that man and dinosaur did live at the same time. Now that video you just saw, this is, the, this is what the creationists uh, use to try and prove that the earth is only 6,000 years old, that man lived with dinosaur, but modern homo sapiens like we are did not live with dinosaurs. These footprints are, are huge. These are what I like to call uh, humanarchy footprints. These are the, the, the people, the Anunnaki, 
who came to Earth um, millions of years ago and have always known about Earth since they could travel into space. So this is a letter, a letter that um, Lloyd Pye got from uh, a geneticist and he wanted to keep his name <coughs> private because you saw what happened earlier when, when, you, when you come out with something you lose your job and uh, you get scoffed at. So this letter reads, I agree with your conclusions that humans are genetically engineered and will give you a few hints, if you wish, speaking as a DNA deep throat. First, look up the huge discontinu discontinuities between humans and the various apes. For one, whole mitochondrial DNA. Two, genes for the RH factor. Three, and human Y chromosomes, among others. Regarding three, I refer to K.D. Smith's 1987 study titled Repeated DNA Sequences of the Human Y Chromosome. It says, most human Y chromosome sequences thus far examined do not have the homologues same relative position or structure on the Y chromosome of others, primates. Human female X chromosomes do look somewhat like ape-like, but not the male Ys. This means that if humans are a cross-bred species, the cross had to be between a female ape-like creature, i.e. creature of the earth, and a male being from elsewhere. What evidence backs up the Zamerian text? The FOXP2 gene, no origins in apes. The HAR1 gene, no origins in apes. 2% unknown DNA. Knowledge of the celestial bodies, the solar system. Fusion of 48 to 46 chromosomes. Doesn't happen by nature. Uh, if it did, if, when it does happen by nature, you get a uh, you get you get a, 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 a chimera, like a, a not a, not a, an intelligent creature. It will just be a, a misfit. The Earth was called the seventh planet, so they were counting from the outside in. Mitochondrial DNA signature says 250 years old or new, whichever way you want to look at it. So the mitochondrial DNA is um, something that's passed down intact from female to female. Um, the, X and Y chromosome that mixes together like half from the mother, half from the father, that gets mixed up between the two. But the mitochondrial DNA, that's passed down. And when they've traced it back, they've traced it back and they've done it time and time again, the same experiment, different labs, because they can never get the, the, the head around it and believe it. It comes back to a woman in South Africa 250,000 years ago, which is exactly when the Sumerian say man was created. The nuclear DNA uh, points to being billions of years old. So these Anunnaki or humanarchy that come from another planet um, within our solar system have been around for billions of years. So the Anunnaki called our planet Eridu, which means home away from home. This is the granting of the plough. This is kept in a museum in Berlin. Um, this bit here is our solar system with all the planets around it and relative sizes as well. You couldn't just come up with something like this by chance. This is, uh, you'd have to know about the solar system, uh, that the sun is in the middle and that the planets go around the outside. When you think about it, just three, 400 years ago, um, they thought the Earth was flat, and that we were the center of the universe and everything went around us. And in fact, people like Giordano Bruno got burned at the stake for suggesting otherwise, but we now know that he, he, he was correct. And uh, it's the other way around. Uranus was not known to modern man until discovered in 1781, Neptune in 1846, and Pluto in 1930. So, we didn't find out about these outer planets until recently, but they knew about them. They wrote about them, they described them, and to, to get everything so accurately correct by chance is, in my mind, impossible. This is our solar system. Um, 
And scientists are growing more and more in the belief of this opinion that our sun is a binary star system. Like most of the suns that you see in the universe, 90% of them are binary, uh, which means they have a companion star. And this companion star we have is called a red dwarf. And the re this red dwarf has a solar system of seven planets going around it. And you can see it here, that's the red dwarf. And this solar system has one big planet, which the Sumerians called Nibiru, which is where the Anunnaki came from. And this was four times the size of Earth. And it's supposed to come through our solar system, so they haven't put the planets around there. But if you can imagine, this is the, the our binary star. Um, it's very hard to see because it's a red dwarf, so it, it's not bright like the sun, but it does give off a lot of heat. Um, and it's got its own solar system, so these planets are flying around here and then it comes through our solar system every 3,600 years. And every time it does, all the planets either miss or some of them smash into each other. And you can see <coughs> between Mars, between Mars, there's uh, the asteroid belt. This was a planet that got hit by one of these planets a long, long time ago. Clip the video, please. On August 19, 1977, the American space probe Voyager 2 leaves Cape Canaveral on a several-year journey to the vicinity of this solar system's most distant planets. The Voyager's discoveries challenge many of astronomy's recent conclusions, while fully corroborating ancient knowledge. For the first time, we see images of Uranus. Astonishing. It is exactly as the Sumerians report in their 6,000-year-old description. Though they have no telescopes that we know of, the Sumerians characterize Uranus as Mosh Seek, translated bright greenish. They also explain the unique planetary tilt of Uranus. According to the Sumerians, our solar system was invaded by a planetary body that caused collisions and disrupted the existing order. NASA scientists concurred that a collision with a body the size of Earth traveling at 40,000 miles per hour could have caused both the orbital skew of Uranus and the devastation apparent from the planet's surface scarring. Its neighbor Neptune was described as a blue-green planet by the Sumerians millennia ago, but science has only confirmed this fact during the past few decades. The Sumerians named and listed all of the planets in our solar system. Their documented list of these planets is tangible evidence that in at least one respect, modern man is on a path of rediscovery. <coughs> this is from one of the clay tablets. The Anunnaki came to Earth to mine gold circa 450,000 years ago. And the reason they came for gold was that their atmosphere was dying where they got so over advanced and they needed something to protect their atmosphere and gold was the best thing to do with it. So this is written from one of the tablets, Enki's house, mines and technology in the midst of the Abzu. This is the mines, the Abzu means mines underground to a place of pure waters, Enki betook himself. In that land, a place of deepness, he determined for the heroes into the earth's bowels to descend. The earth split at Enki, there established there within, in the earth a gash to make, by way of tunnels, earth's innards to reach, the golden veins to uncover. Okay. The video. Yeah. No, no, yes, sir. According to Sumerian text, the <coughs> of landing 445,000 years ago sent androids to scout the Earth. 150,000 years later, the Anunnaki themselves arrive and create humankind. How was Adam created? According to the Sumerians, it was by genetic engineering, fertilization in vitro, in a glass tube as depicted in this cylinder seal rendering. Events before the deluge, 450 to 400,000 BC. So, 450,000 years ago, 
on Nibiru, life faces slow extinction as the planet's atmosphere erodes. And this is translated from these tablets. Deposed by Anu, the ruler Alaru escapes in a spaceship and finds refuge on Earth, which means that they've been they have talked about coming to Earth for a very, very long time. They've known about the planet since the very beginning. 445 years and thousand years ago, led by Enki, a son of Anu, the Anunnaki land on Earth, established Eridu, Earth Station, for extracting gold from the waters of the Persian Gulf. 430,000 years, Earth's climate mellows, more Anunnaki arrive on Earth, among them Enki's half-sister, Ninhurtse, chief medical officer. 416,000 years ago, as gold production falters, Anu arrives on Earth with Enil. Enil is Enki's half-brother. It is decided to obtain the vital gold by mining it in South Africa. Drawing lots, Enil wins command of the Earth mission. Enki is relegated to Africa. On departing Earth, Anu is challenged by Alaru's grandson. 400,000 years ago, Seven functional settlements in southern Mesopotamia include a spaceport, SIPA, mission control center, and Nepur, a metallurgical center, Shurapak. The ores arrive by ships from Africa. The refined metal is sent aloft to orbiters manned by the Ijiji, then transferred to spaceships arriving periodically from Earth. Now, there's not much said about the Ijiji, but people think they are describing the grey aliens, the little greys, these are the Ajiji. But there's not enough information about it though, it's just a, that's just what some people think. Events before the deluge, 380,000 to 49,000 BC. 380,000 years ago, gaining the support of the Ajiji, Aladu's grandson attempts to seize mastery over the earth. The Enelites win the war of the olden gods. 250,000 years ago, the Anunnaki toiling in the gold mines mutiny. Enki and Ninhursake create a primitive worker through genetic manipulation of ape woman to Enel's annoyance. Some Anunnaki marry the daughters of man, primitive workers to the Eden in Mesopotamia. Given the ability to procreate, Homo sapiens begins to multiply. 200,000 years ago, life on Earth regresses during a new glacial period. 100,000, climate warms again. 75,000, the accusation of Earth, a new ice age begins. Regressive types of man roam the Earth. Pro Magnum man survives. 49,000 years ago, Enki and then Herseg elevate humans of Anunnaki parentage to rule in Shapura. Enil, enraged, plots mankind's demise. Enki decides to clone a species. Let us create a Lulu, a primitive worker the hardship work to take over. Let the being, the toil of the Anunnaki, carry on his back. This is translated from this tablet. Planning to break the Adam as a slave. A primitive worker shall be created. Our command will he understand. Our tools he will handle. To the Anunnaki and the Abzu, relief shall come. Video. their incredible equipment, they find a planet that has this, it's got gold. So they decide, we're going to go there and we're going to mine. So they send some expeditions to planet Earth. All of a sudden they get here and the factions begin to say, well there's a lot of gold here, but we're not digging it out. What are we going to do? We need workers. The story that came down to the Sumerians is that the Anunnaki were mining gold on the earth and uh, the run-of-the-mill workers complain that this is really hard work and we're tired we don't want to do this anymore and so they had a big council they decided to create a primitive worker called an Adamo. so they look at what is on this planet and that is homo erectus and they say well they're not very intelligent and they're not going to listen to us so we're going to genetically alter them. The Anunnaki created uh, humans as a slave species. According to Zechariah Sitchin, the Adamu were the first modern humans. They were created by the Anunnaki 450,000 years ago. 
when they genetically mix their DNA with that of prehistoric man. They took one cell of one of these ancestors of us. They changed the cell by an artificial mutation. They changed the DNA code, what our genetics are doing every day. It's carved in their stone. This is not something made up. This is part of the Sumerian history. Events after the deluge, 13,000 to 10,500 BC, 13,000 years ago, realizing that the passage of Nibiru in Earth's proximity will trigger an immense tidal wave, anyone makes the Anunnaki swear to keep the impending calamity a secret from mankind. 11,000 BC, Enki breaks the oath, instructs the Azudra, Noah, to build a submersible ship. The deluge sweeps over the Earth. The Anunnaki witness the total destruction from their orbiting spacecraft. Enel agrees to grant the remnants of mankind implements and seeds. Agriculture begins in the highlands. Enki domesticates animals. 10,500 BC. The descendants of Noah are allotted three regions. Ninurta, Enel's foremost son, dams the mountains and drains the rivers to make Mesopotamia habitable. Enki reclaims the Nile Valley. The Sinai Peninsula is retained by the Anunnaki for a post-individual spaceport. A control center is established on Mount Mora, the future of Jerusalem. Events after the deluge, 9780 BC, Ra, Marduk, Enki's firstborn son, divides dominion over Egypt between Osiris and Seth. 9330 BC, Seth seizes and dismembers Osiris, assumes sole rule over the Nile Valley. 8970 BC, Horus <coughs> avenges his father Osiris by launching the first pyramid war. Seth, Seth escapes to Asia, seizes the Sinai Peninsula and Canaan. 8670 BC, opposed to the resulting control of all the space facilities by Enki's descendants. The Enolites launch the Second Pyramid War. The victorious Ninurta empties the Great Pyramid of its equipment. Ninhursak, half-sister of Enki and Enil, convenes a peace conference. The division of Earth is reaffirmed, ruled over Egypt transferred from the from Ra Marduk dynasty of that of Thoth. Heliopolis built as a substitute beacon city. Kingships on Earth. The Anunnaki established outposts at the gateway to the space facilities. Jericho is one of them. 7400 BC. As the era of peace continues, the Anunnaki grant mankind new advances. The Neolithic period begins. Demigods rule over Egypt. 3800 BC. Urban civilization begins in Zuma. As the Anunnaki re establish there the <laughs> olden cities, beginning with Eridu and Nippur. Anu comes to Earth to visit. A new city, Uruk, Erech, is built in his honor. He makes it his temple, the abode of his beloved granddaughter, Inanna, Ishtar. The fateful century, 2024. Leaving his followers, Marduk marches on Zuma and thrones himself in Babylon. Fighting spreads to central Mesopotamia. The first holy holies is defiled. Enil demands punishment for Marduk and Nabu. Enki opposes, but his son Nagao sides with Enil. As, as Nabu marshals his Kenite followers to capture the spaceport, the great Anunnaki approve of the use of nuclear weapons. Nagao and Nurtra destroy the spaceport and the errant Kenite cities. 2023, the winds carry the radioactive cloud to Zuma. People die. A terrible death, animals perish, the water is poisoned, the soil becomes barren. Zuma and its great civilization lie prostate. Its legacy passes to Abraham's seed as he begets at age 100 a legitimate heir, Isaac. And this is um, Mahendradaro, which I found recently, um, about 15 years ago. It's in the Indus Valley in Pakistan. and. There's just skeletons scattered all over the city and they just, they died while they were walking. 
and they're highly radioactive. You can't go near them, you can't go in the city. Um, this is one of many places found that where the radioactivity is very, very high. This is Queen Puabi. Queen Puabi, as she was found by Leonard Woolley, who was excavating there. And if you look at her skull, it's quite big. She, uh, she could have been a hybrid. So this is the cross section of an x-ray of uh, Queen Puabi's skull, and this is a normal human skull. So you can see there's quite a difference. And they actually, DNA testing is underway for, for this, so whether they come out with it or not remains to be seen. Gold mines in South Africa. So this is the really the guy behind this is uh, Michael Tellinger. If you look him up, he's the expert on South Africa um, and and everything that he's discovering there. There's new things being found there all the time. With you. Closer comparisons between the Hebrew Bible and the Sumerian texts reveal many similarities, not only in their stories but also in their language. Adam is Hebrew for man. The Damu is what the Sumerians refer to as first man, the Anunnaki slaves. But do the Sumerian tablets actually describe an alien race? A race that conducted mining operations on a global scale. Thousands of miles away, on the African continent, Ruins of ancient gold mines have recently been discovered. The largest concentration can be found in South Africa, where some excavations, according to scientists, date back some 150,000 years. There are in areas that have an abundance of gold right now, so it's very possible that they could have mined it. Now the big question is, how do we know they weren't human beings that simply did that? Why the ET theory? In many languages in Africa, the native word for star means bringer of knowledge or enlightenment. Some African cultures believe that extraterrestrial beings have been visiting the Earth for tens of thousands of years. Zulu legends speak of a time when visitors from the stars came to excavate gold and other natural resources. These mines were worked by artificially produced flesh and blood slaves created by the first people. Some ancient mines in southern Africa are thought to be a hundred thousand years old or older. If humans weren't doing that mining a hundred thousand years ago and making metals, then we would have to assume be extraterrestrials doing it. Alien slave mines? Genetically engineered humans? To believers of ancient astronaut theory, these notions are not far-fetched fantasies or fairy tales, but facts. And they point to additional evidence of alien mining a half world away on the American continent. It was just big sand mounds and then all of a sudden they found these uh, remnants of these great monuments underneath. And inside there's passageways and chambers and all sorts of stuff in there. And God knows what they took out of these places, but they definitely took out something important because there's American guards on all of these all over Iraq. And so you can see here the <laughs> Temple of Ur, which is where Abraham comes from. Abraham of Ur of the Chaldees, <laughs> um, discovered by Charles Leonard Woolley. Um, and this is what it looked like when it was uncovered, big mound of sand over the top of it. And that's what it looked like after Saddam renovated it. So, brought it back. And this was actually his base of operations, Saddam was, during the Iraq war. And you can see here, this is the, the great library of Ashurbanipal, which is um, when you saw the tablets at the beginning of the presentation, uh, in the chambers down, down, down the bottom. Right? These are the <laughs> this is where it come from. And again, this is highly radioactive around here and it's, it's guarded by Americans. You can't go any, to any of these places out there. You can't visit none of them. They're all under military guards. You can see here, this is the great, <coughs> this is the Temple of Ur, this is the Garat, and American chopper flying over, American soldiers on top, 
like I said, they've been guarding this place ever since they went into Baghdad and clicked it here quickly. Another piece of startling evidence, one of the most elite naval units in military history, known as Task Force 20, is dispatched in 2003 with the mission to find and terminate high-profile enemy targets in Iraq. They were approximately 1,500 of the military's finest special forces people, and their job in Iraq after the invasion of 2003 was essentially to find Saddam Hussein according to the public record. But the unit's priorities raise questions. Early on in the invasion, Task Force 20 engages in a vicious firefight with Iraqi soldiers, not at a military target, but at the National Museum of Iraq. Why would the U.S. government spend so many resources trying to get to the National Museum of Iraq? And why was the Iraqi Republican Guard there defending it? Task Force 20, um, it had multiple missions, but its most secret mission was really to scour all of Iraq's ancient sites, all of Iraq's museums, for any information. <coughs> I stopped earlier, or not? I don't know. <laughs> again here, this is the Temple of War. Again, you can see all the Americans rushing up. And they all have their headquarters there as well now. There's places to sleep in there, cook food in there, and all sorts of stuff. Convenient for them. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's huge. It's huge <laughs> underneath. There's, there's chambers and stuff everywhere. And you can imagine what they've done with it. You know, they've got, they've got their own rooms and all sorts of stuff there now. Again here, armed American guards outside the museum. Um, <coughs> Experts say three massive staircases leading into the temple were restored by Saddam. And not just to allow for easier access, they were also built to carry things out. <coughs> this is Herman Obath, he's a German rocket scientist. And all, all the German scientists, when, when they were asked, they all get their inspiration or their, their knowledge, they say, from the ancient Vedic scripts, the ancient Sumerians. And in actual fact, <coughs> Hitler was digging all over the world, every single ancient site. He had a team of people there trying to find lost technologies or ancient knowledge. So Herman Obuff says we cannot take the credit for our record advancement in certain scientific fields alone. We have been helped. This is an ex-Nazi general. It's the head of NASA, Werner von Braun. Um, when you see him in a Nazi <laughs> uniform, and then you see him in this uniform, and he's the head of NASA, and then people say NASA is a civilian organization, well, you've got an ex-Nazi general in charge of NASA, it's not very civilian. Um, it's what, this is what Von Brown said. We found ourselves faced by powers which are far stronger than Hitler assumed and whose base is at present unknown to us. More I cannot say at present. We are now engaged in entering into closer contact with these powers and within six or nine months time it may be possible to speak with more precision on the matter. It's Hans Kammler. He was in charge of the Nazi Bell project. Um, this project was based on the ancient Sanskrit writings where you had uh, mercury engines and this is supposedly what this Nazi Bell had, some sort of mercury engine. Um, and this is a Professor Walter Gerlach. He was overall in charge of it and uh, in charge of the uranium as well for Germany. These guys went missing after the world, but no one's ever found them. Um, People say they were they were brought under Project Paperclip and they were taken to America. They were given new identities. Um, but these guys were way ahead of their time. And again, they all said that they found all their information from ancient Sumerian texts because they were digging in Iraq and ancient Vedic texts as well. <clears throat> this is a, one of the rendering of a, an anarchy and they, they, they give wings to make it symbolic. It's just basically um, to show that they could fly. 
Um, we all know there's no humans that have got wings, but that's what they, the way of saying that they had the, the power of flight. This is out of the Bible. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they brought children to them, the mighty, uh, the same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. And the Zumerians mention <coughs> two planets. Um, in, in the text, it says a lot about the moon, uh, and it also says a lot about Mars. Mars was a way station, and, uh, and the moon was a base. And uh, They don't write about any other planets being so, they only write about Mars and the moon. And these are the first men to, to, to land on You've got Neil Armstrong here, Michael Collins here, and Buzz, Edwin Buzz Aldrin here. Now, when they landed on the moon, you've, you've heard of the moon landings being faked, obviously, and so there's, you've got one site that says, oh, all the moon landings were faked, they never went there. Well, in actual fact, the moon landings that we watched on TV were fake, but they did land on the moon, they just didn't show you. And, what, and the reason why they did this was they, they, they had to land on the moon, whether they actually did it or not. Um, because they were in a race with the Russians. This was like a Cold War race. So if these guys died on the way to the moon, they'd release the video, say, look, we landed, but they died on the way home. Um, so it was just a safety measure. So uh, whichever way you looked at it, the Americans said, right, we're landing on the moon. So they had this prepared. And the video was called Jezebel. So release Jezebel, that's what they said when, uh, when, when, they, when they had to use the, the fake landings for broadcast. Because what happened with these guys um, was actually Neil Armstrong set, set foot on the, the moon first and then Buzz Aldrin. But they deviated from their mission. Because when they got there, they couldn't believe what they saw. And all three resigned shortly after they got home. All of them resigned, uh, all at the same time. And obviously they were sworn to secrecy, they were sworn they can't say nothing. And it sort of uh, must have played on their minds for quite a long time because Neil Armstrong was quite the explorer. He went on uh, a mission with uh, Stanley Hall in uh, 1976 to find the Metal Library. And this was in, uh, in Peru, the, the Metal Library. Uh, it's supposed to have been a myth as well, but some people did find it and they tried looking for this. But just before he died, um, Neil Armstrong made a speech. And if you, if you watch and listen to his body language, and listen to what he has to say, it's quite interesting. Thank you, Mr. Vice President, Mr. President, members of Congress, fellow astronauts, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Over right once noted that the only bird that could talk was the parrot. And he didn't fly very well. <laughs> so it didn't fly very well. Everyone's laughing there, Andrew. Well, you think Armstrong's referring to someone who was murdered, one of his colleagues. I think he's referring right. to Jefferson, yeah. All right. <laughs> so I'll, I'll be brief. <laughs> This, this week, uh, America has been recalling the Apollo program and reliving uh, the memories of those times in which so many of us here, colleagues here in the first rows, were immersed. Today we have with us uh, a group of students among America's best. To you, we say, We've only completed a beginning. We leave you much that is undone. There are great ideas undiscovered, breakthroughs available to those who can remove one of truth's protective layers. There are places to go beyond belief. Those challenges are yours. In many fields, not the least of which is space, because there lies human destiny.
So I don't know if you picked up on his body language, but he actually he comes across quite disgusted with the, the space program um, because he's just been told to keep quiet about everything. And you can see the frustration on his face. And then when he says, "What a truce protective veil," <laughs> and after the Apollo landing, like I said, they all resigned. He had nothing to do with NASA anymore. He went about his own. He, that's it. He, he's finished with it. You would have thought the first man on the moon would have been doing mission after mission after mission because of the experience he's got. Uh, but now he walked away. So something must have really, really upset him for him, for him to walk away. And of course, if you're a, a, an explorer like he is and you've seen things and you want to tell the public about it, but you've been told your family going to get killed if you say anything, which is what they do. And uh, yeah, this, this is what happens. But Buzz Aldrin's an interesting character as well, because if you ask him about anything unnatural, he contradicts himself a few times, he's a bit of a hypocrite, because he does say he's seen UFOs outside of the, uh, the window when, when he was going to the moon. Um, and then when you ask him more in more detail, he says, no, no, I don't want to talk about it, I want to talk about it. But he gives you cryptic messages, and if you listen to what he says here, it's, it's quite interesting. When man first landed on the moon, our perspective on the universe changed forever. We aliens who happened to go down the ladder on July 20th, 1969. We aliens were certainly part of a magnificent race. Now, I don't know if I'm the only one here who picked up on that, but I'm sure you did as well. He's basically telling you something. He's calling us, we aliens, which is basically telling you we're not from here. <coughs> and then he's saying we're part of something much bigger because he's seen it. He knows this to be true. They all know this to be true. <coughs> These are some uh, uh, moon anomalies and towers and rectangular structures. So we've got this, is called the shard. It sticks up, uh, no one knows what it is. It looks like an aerial. It's about three miles high. Uh, three miles long, it's huge, and it's just this is a NASA photograph. You can go on the archives and find this, so um, it casts a shadow. Um, this is a rectangular structure, uh, obviously covered with uh, moon dust, so not very often nature does that. And this is the shard again. And you can see like rectangular structures here, buried under the, the sand, and this thing sticking up here. Again, these are NASA photos. Um, this is uh, Apollo 15 photographs, Apollo 20 film footage. So we have here. This is the Apollo 15 mission, and they photograph this on the far side of the moon. And after this, they had two more Apollo missions to find out some more things. So Apollo 16, Apollo 17 came back with more information. Um, and then Apollos 18, 19, and 20 were supposed to have been cancelled, but they actually went into control of the CIA. So the CIA controlled those missions and they became black projects. Did the video? <clears throat> An emblem of the Russian and American flag apparently commemorates the purported joint U.S.-USSR mission, which Rutledge claimed it was. When the sequence documenting the trip down to the lunar surface begins, the focus of the mission soon comes clearly into view. So you can see that type of fuselage thing sticking out the ground here in, in, the, in the crater and that was the video footage you saw of a, uh, Apollo, Apollo 20 coming in and here it is again so this is a Apollo 20 investigator inside the ship found on the moon CIA control program and these are the sides from the video put together to piece together one picture of what it looked like 
and how this was made, you can see the potholes here, um, where asteroids have hit this. If you're going to build, a, if you're going to build an intergalactic, you know, an interstellar vehicle, how do you get the materials from your home planet into space to build it with? This thing's huge. Well, you don't. You find the nearest asteroid, and then you carve it out. I don't know. No one knows how they did it, but this is what it looks like. It's made from asteroid material and hollowed out. <coughs> this you make, and then you have the smaller ships that come out of that. Click the video. You have to just click right here. Well, there, there's there's a video that shows um, reportedly the head of this woman with her eyes being propped open by some kind of wires. Whether it shows a whole being or not, this footage, including the strange writing depicted, has sparked much speculation about the condition she was found in and her possible ties to Earth culture mythology. Now that's supposedly a video of the, the occupant of this craft and the one you saw with the things on the face, that was a severed head. And then the one you saw without, that was another one but sitting in the, in the seat. Um, the video footage, when people have looked at it, some say it's fake, uh, some say it's not. Um, personally, I think it's a leaked video. I think that myself. If you were going to make something really, really astounding, why not make it look like a real bad looking alien? Why does it look human? Um, so we speculate that that's an Anunnaki that they found there um, on the moon on a, on a, on a crashed spaceship or, or abandoned. Um, so this is uh, under the Freedom of Information Act. You can get this document. Um, obviously, over a certain amount of time, documents become you, you, you disclosed, so you can you can apply and get them. And this is a, a letter here, and what it actually says, the most important part, you can see lots of blacked out bits, this is what you get with loads of documents when you apply it uh, for the Freedom of Information Act. It says on November 14th, then there's the blank space, this is the blackout bit, um, the directive of, I speculate, the CIA, the mission status has been altered, the revised status shifts from cancellation to postponement, potential dates of mission reinstatement include blank, and if orders to redeploy, now redeploy is a military term, which leads me to believe that, it, or leads people to believe that it's run by the CIA now, are received by such and such day, <coughs> we can confidently expect to launch on or before blank. So that's your document there for the Apollos 18, 19, and 20. <coughs> These are from the NASA archives, there's no number with them, so obviously they're really hard to trace, but they're supposed to be there from here. Now this is a Apollo 11 photo with stones that look, look like Stonehenge, you know, similar to it, but obviously not as big. And then Apollo 17 when they landed on the far side of the moon um, to explore the, the craft that they found, the fuselage and this. Um, if you listen to the audio, it's, this, this, uh, this program is in Spanish, but when uh, you can hear the astronauts talking in English, so just listen out for that. Don't watch the, what the video is, it's not important. It's the audio that's important. And this was recorded by someone who, who got hold of the closed channel communications, because they have two channels. They have the public channel, and then they have the, the, the secret channel. Um, we don't know why they have two channels. If they've got nothing to hide, they should just have one channel. But they, they've got plenty to hide, so they switch to the secret channel. And click. Quedaron perplejos a los técnicos de Houston. Al otro 
lado del cráter existente a poco más de 60 metros de lávida, habían aparecido unas naves y unos seres. Which is what they had to do because the astronauts weren't listening to mission control. They had the, the chess camera, and obviously the chess camera was looking at these leftover monuments, and they couldn't they couldn't go to broadcast. They, the, the the TV stations were waiting for the live broadcast, and the astronauts wouldn't do what mission control said. They they had the cameras focused on these ruins, so they said release Jezebel, and that's when they had. The fake footage come onto the TV because they couldn't show you what they were actually looking at. Uh, this is Jack Smith. He's a part of 17 um, astronaut, and these are his patches that he designed. Because all the astronauts get to be part of the program, so they they can design their own patches, stuff like that. And, um, but obviously they were rejected. Uh, what's interesting is that he's got Stonehenge, Stonehenge, and if you go back to the picture we just saw with a little Stonehenge-looking place, it's kind of strange or a, not a coincidence, I don't know, it's uh, too much of a coincidence if you ask me. Uh, again, this is from the Apollo 17 online archive, you can see these, you can get these online from NASA. Planet Mars, now, it's what Mars looks like now, and 100,000 years ago, Mars looked like planet Earth. You could live on Mars like you could live on Earth. Obviously it's a third of the Earth's gravity, so your bones would become weaker. You'd actually become taller as well, where your, your children would anyway, because of the lack of gravity there. Um, but coming into our solar system over 100,000 years ago, you would see Earth and you'd see another planet, uh, Mars, which looked like Earth. So you've got two planets that you can live on, so two habitable planets. And then you have the asteroid belt in between. No one knows what that was. Maybe that was a third habitable planet. You know, so that, that, that sort of shows you that you've got these planets in one solar system, a small solar system, they're probably all over the place, the habitable planets. Statistically, they, they are. Um, Cliff? When NASA's unmanned spacecraft visits Mars in the 70s and again in the 90s, ample evidence of water in that planet's past is revealed. Images from expeditions to Venus and Mars exhibit visual evidence of dry sea, lake, and riverbeds characteristic of the biblical reference, waters above the firmament. Even Mercury, so close to the sun, seems to have had a watery past, yet maintaining ice at its polar caps. The NASA report reads, quote, We are forced to no other conclusion but that we are seeing the effects of water on Mars, unquote. And, quote, Mars once had enough water to form a layer several meters deep over the whole surface of the planet, unquote. What we previously believed to be a dry and barren planet unexpectedly emerges as a planet where water once existed in abundance. Mars joins Venus, Mercury, the Earth, and most recently the Earth's moon in corroborating the Sumerian concept of water below the firmament. So there's a Mars-Earth comparison. Um, you can see that Mars is quite a lot smaller than the Earth. There's uh, the gravity difference here. Um, but it's got the same sort of rotation around the Sun, pretty similar. Um, when, when, it, when Mars was habitable, it's, uh, you, know, you, could, you could just pop from planet to planet. You could stay there a few weeks, live quite comfortably. You'd be really strong there and you'd be able to jump quite high because of the lack of gravity. You'd come back to Earth after that and you'd you'd feel very, very weak and heavy. Um, so, what the uh, old expeditions to Mars, <coughs> when they sent the rovers there, they had like a filter on the, on the lens, and it was like a, a red filter to stop the UV light from burning out the camera lens or something like that, but it was a red, so everyone thought that this planet's red, red dust, red sky, but more recently, we've had the real footage without these old filters, they've got new filters now, So it shows you what the Mars actually looks like, and it's incredibly like planet Earth. Video? Panspermia is the theory that life formed in one place and then got spread around to other places. In outer space, in the medium between stars, we see molecules that are the building blocks of life. So it's easy to get the building blocks of life to another planet. 
For example, if life formed on Mars, it could have come here to Earth. Contaminated Earth, and then started life here. Roughly 3.6 billion years ago, Mars was warm and wet, much like the conditions on Earth today. Biologists believe that because Mars cooled more quickly than other planets, life may have developed there first. Mars is a better candidate for life during the early part of the solar system. Mars rocks are coming here all the time, and these have been knocked off Mars by asteroid and comet impacts. And we know that uh, they could convey any Martian microorganisms to Earth. In August 1996, a team of scientists made a stunning announcement. A Martian meteorite found in Antarctica contained evidence of fossilized life. The four-pound rock, designated ALH 84001, showed the presence of carbonate globules excreted by microbes when they were alive on Mars 3.6 billion years ago. Earth was no longer alone. Life had existed elsewhere in the universe. So this cross-contamination between Mars and Earth, which 20 years ago was regarded as a rather wild conjecture, is now pretty much accepted by the astrobiology community. And here we've got some uh, other Mars anomalies, so this is a uh Another photo from one of the orbiters here as well. Rectangles uh, sun, hidden under the, underneath the dust. This is a comparison. So this is uh, between the, the ruins of, uh, in the deserts of Iran and on Mars. So this is a, a Mars photograph. It looks like rectangular structures there. And this is a photograph of uh, from from Earth orbit looking at Earth. So it's quite similar. This is one of the rovers on, on Mars, I think it's Spirit Rover, so you can see these funny looking cone shaped pyramid things. Um, they're not very big, they're about sort of four to six foot. And then we have something very similar here in the Sudan. This is a Spirit Rover, so you can get this from the, 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 the NASA website. Um, if you look here, it looks like a skull. The first color photographs of the Martian surface were taken by a rover in 2004. The images revealed that the red planet was anything but. One of the things that shocked people in 2004 when NASA and JPL released these photos was this wasn't the dead planet that we've been led to believe with a brown sky and brown dusty surface that when you look at this bluish sky and when you look at the surface of the Martian uh, ground it very much resembled the surface of Earth. skulls and skeletal remains so you can see this photo was taken from a distance they've zoomed in on it um, and again it looks like a skull there and of course you would have remains if, if anything had habitated that planet um, of course it died there and it would leave remains and this is quite a good close-up of that picture there photo taken by NASA Mars Exploration Spirit Rover this is the code so you can find this on the NASA website uh, JPL um, so Skull, eyes, nose, top part of the mouth there. The Great Pyramid. I don't know if there's, has anyone been to the Great Pyramid? Anyone been there? Yeah? It's, it's, when you've been there, it's absolutely fantastic. These blocks here, if you can imagine this room, they are the height of this room. And cut the room in half. That's your average size block for the Great Pyramid. So that's your average size block here. 
and there's over 2.5 million of them which make up the Great Pyramid. Um, in 2006, Dr. Michael Barsoom of Drexel University and colleagues found an early form of poured geopolymer concrete was used to build the Great Pyramid, upsetting the age-old myth that it was constructed of limestone blocks. This poured concrete has three times the hardness of currently used concrete. British engineer Christopher Dunn has theorised that the Great Pyramid, far from being a tomb, was actually an energy generating and delivery device, attesting to a era of unknown technology. And of course, if, if you came from another planet and you set up base here, you would need a power plant. This is what the Great Pyramid is, and this is actually so much older than what people say. It was not built by the Egyptians with rope pulleys and copper tools. Um, copper doesn't leave a chip in granite. Um, and when, when you go there, it's just impossible. It's like, it's like me saying, um, I built your house with a silver dessert spoon. If that's, it's, that's the it's equivalent to when you go to the museum in Cairo and they show you these little tools that look like what a dentist would use and, and then they're made from copper and wood and they say that this is how the uh, pyramid was built and then you have some people, I think a few scientists tried hammering the stones like this out of the quarry, they made a little, they made a little dent, it took them about 10 years to, to do that <laughs> according to their theory um, of how the pyramids were built, it would take them about 20, 30 million years, this was built with a high technology um, and the pits uh, lie around the pyramid, which they say are boat pits. No boats have been found in them. They're, they're not boat pits, they're saw pits. And they housed giant circular saws to cut some of these dressing stones. And like I said, the others were made with this geopolymer concrete as well. And then the inside chambers were granite. Again, different, different materials. So three different materials. You have the inside chambers in the pyramid made of granite. You have the outer stones made of this geopolymer uh, concrete, which was poured into moulds because each of these blocks were exactly the same size. Um, it would take you, it would take you years to to get each one of those blocks right, dressed and cut. Much better pouring a, a mix into a mould than you know you've got the exact thing. And this this is so precise. This building, we couldn't duplicate it today. Now I'm going to show you irrefutable proof that this was not built by the Egyptians because there's nothing in this pyramid uh, that says the Egyptians built it. The only thing that was ever found was inside the king's chamber, here, just above here in the vault. You can crawl up into this vault which is where these stones take the weight of the pyramid. They found a cartouche um, and there was a, a British explorer called Howard Weiss and he was exploring the Great Pyramid in the 19th century, uh, end of the 18th, 19th century, and uh, his funding was coming to an end. And the uh, museum he was working for said, if you don't find something soon, you're out. So he painted a cartouche in there on the ceiling with ink to say that this was built by Khufu. This is why they call this Khufu, the Great Pyramid of Cheops Khufu. Obviously, when um, radio carbon dating came into play and we could, we could uh, use the C14 carbon isotope to test the ink. Um, the ink was tested and it was from the 19th century. <laughs> it wasn't thousands of years old, so that's uh, how advice you were wrong. Um, so this, this underground channel here, they say that water came in this. This is what Christopher Dunn says. It was some sort of hydraulic uh, system here. Um, you had chemicals going into both sides here that caused a, ch a chemical reaction in here um, and it, it created power, you, you would need power, power plant. Another thing about the pyramids, when you go there and you go into all these chambers, this, this is the, uh, the way in up here and then you go into the Grand Gallery and the Grand Gallery is, is incredible. If you can imagine this room, this is wide as this room, pretty much exactly as wide and imagine four times the height. You're just looking up and it's just going straight up to the king's chamber it's incredible and it's a vaulted ceiling it goes in like this it's it's absolutely amazing and these blocks when you look at them you're standing next to the blocks <coughs> they're, they're huge you can't put a razor blade between them 
This is how, this is how finely together they are. This is how well engineered this thing is. It's built to the precision of a machine. You know, it's, it's not a monument, it's not a tomb. This, this was a functional machine. And remember earlier, when we were looking through the, the writings of the Zumerians said that one of the queens came in the Nurta and she took the things out of the pyramids. So it had, it had technological devices in it. Also, when you're doing these shafts and building it here, um, according to the Egyptian belief and the Egyptologists, they, they must have been doing it in the dark because there's no trace of any soot on the ceiling from flame torches, which, which it would have left. Uh, so they said, well, they must be using some sort of mirror. That doesn't work either. Um, so they had a lighting source, which wasn't a naked flame. Um, it, they must have had, because you can't, you can't build all this in the dark. It's impossible. Right, let me go back a minute. So the next photo, this is the king's chamber. These are the shafts that go up on either side. Uh, there was a German engineer and he made a robot. His name was Rudolf Gattenbrink and he begged Zadi Iwas, who's the guy in charge of the pyramid, to say, look, let's put this robot up the shaft, let's see what's up the shaft, because they couldn't, they could only look up so far. So the robot went up and the first time they found this wig here and it had two metal cloths sticking out. Now, these, this is on live TV. This, this is the second one actually. Um, the first one wasn't on live TV. Um, but th these, are an, these are an alloy. This is an alloy, so it's mixed metal, so they must have had some sort of a process of heating them up. Right, this, the second time they went, the, the, the same engineer, Rudolf Gattenbrink, said to Zari I said, look, let's, let's, let's have a look, let's drill through this, this, this plug here, let's, let's see what's on the other side. So, Eventually he agreed, uh, it took them a long time, about six or eight years to, to, to get the to permission to go in again. They made a live TV program out of it. So the robot went up, it drilled a hole through, came back, they put the camera through. Now, this is the, this is the back of the clasp here, there's one of these pins here, and it's corroded like you would get with like an elect electrical terminal. And then down here on the floor, you can see symbols. Now this is the only inscription in the pyramid. And whoever built it put these here. I mean, it's not Egyptian. So that's, that's proof there that the Egyptians didn't build it. Because this, this, this is language, no one knows what it is. Christopher Dunn speculates these are electrical symbols. This is a close-up <coughs> of the symbols. So proof that the pyramids were not built by the Egyptians. And you can see here, all these symbols are different. There's no, none of these in any of the ancient Egyptian uh, writings. None of these at all. Click the video. Engineer Chris Dunn believes the answer can be found by further examination of the shafts in what some call the Queen's Chamber, where traces of zinc and hydrochloric acid have been discovered. I believe the chemical coming in through the northern shaft was hydrated zinc and the other chemical coming through the southern shaft and into the chamber was dilute hydrochloric acid. These are actually seen on the chamber walls. Dunn suggests that the two chemicals were poured down through the shafts and then mixed together inside the queen's chamber, triggering combustion. This vessel represents the Queen's Chamber. Into the tubes we're going to pour hydrated zinc and then hydrochloric acid. When you bring these two liquids together, a chemical reaction occurs and a product of that chemical reaction is hydrogen. And you can see the vapor, the hydrogen, escaping through the chimney. They have the reaction. Dunn speculates that the hydrogen gas traveled from the Queen's Chamber into the King's Chamber. Then, the vibrations 
from the subterranean pool energized the hydrogen atoms into a microwave energy beam. The evidence that indicates the use of hydrogen can be found in the King's chamber. There is a shaft in the King's chamber has dimensions of 8.4 by 4.8, which would be suitable for a waveguide for a maser or microwave amplification through stimulated emission radiation. And from there, we can actually propose many different ideas of what they did with it. So this is um, now back in Lebanon, uh, Temple of Jupiter, uh, which is called by the Romans, they built on top of this. And these stones are the biggest stones uh, in the world. These are called the Trilithon, and they, they are huge. They weigh, they weigh over a thousand tons. They don't know exactly how much they weigh, they just know there's nothing we have that can lift this today, absolutely nothing. Not even if you put every single crane that we can get around the world, you couldn't lift this off the floor. So someone did this actually quite simply by the looks of it, if we can't do that today. This is um, Olante Tambo in South America. And see this wall is huge. It's just built and slotted together with these stones and they fit exactly. They're, they've got eight sides, nine sides, some have got 10 sides, five sides. Each one of these fits perfectly together. And another thing they found out was a very, very high heat source fused them together. So there's no mortar in between the joints. You can't push anything in between the joints. These are, these are stuck together. So when they were put in place, it's speculated that these were like red, glowing red, and then slotted in place and then left to cool, and then they just fused together. Um, again, here's the wall in Ante Tambo. These were taken from the opposite side of the, the, the mountain from another place. So this is the side that's uh, on one, on one side of the mountain, these are the blocks that are used to build the wall. And then on the other side, this is where they were cut from. And, and this, this rock is not granite, it's diorite. It's the hardest substance on the planet. You need diamond tip tools to cut this, or laser. There's, there's nothing else that can touch it. And these surfaces here, from the cut rock, are smooth as a mirror, smooth as glass which shows that a high heat source has caused it to vitrify. Here's a close-up of the same thing. You can see it curves round here. It's not a right angle. Something's nicely cut it round here like this and left it all nice and smooth. And at the bottom here, crisscross marks where if something's gone in, but drilled in like this and drilled in like this to break it away from the bottom after it's been cut around here. It's quite incredible. Um, there's, there's no way you could do this with the, the little hammer and the, a little copper chisel or, or anything else. This is a high technology that's done this. There's no other explanation for it. You, know, you can ignore it as much as you like, but it's there. It's right in front of our eyes. This is a close-up of the uh, crisscross marks to break away the big the, the big sand. You can see they're dead straight. Some sort, of, <coughs> some sort of machine, high powered machine has cut this to take the big chunk out to build over the other side. This is more, uh, this is like a, a small, it's called levitated mass. They, they, they got this rock, rock from a quarry um, and uh, for Los Angeles County Museum. And this just gives you an idea of how much trouble we have today moving a relatively small block uh, from one place to another. Workers from 100 utility crews, a 1.4 million pound crane, and a 44 axle tractor trailer rig with over 2,400 horsepower are needed to move the rock. And it's going to require hydraulically jacking the boulder up off the ground, which is incredibly uh, difficult in itself. 
building steel girders underneath it, placing 208 tires underneath those steel girders, having one power unit pulling it and one pushing it, and still after all that only achieving about five miles an hour. Here's a comparison. This is the Levitate Massive, which is the stone you just saw that they were trying to move, or did move. Uh, you have the Western Stone, which is the stones underneath the Temple Mount, where the, the mosque is now. Um, the Ramesseum, and these are the Trilithon that you saw in the picture earlier from Baalbek in Lebanon, uh, which the Temple of Jupiter was uh, built on top. Uh, you can see the weights here, Levitate Mass, 68,000 pounds. The Western Stone, 1.2 million pounds. The Ramesseum, two million pounds, and these things, 4.8 million pounds. It's uh, unbelievable. Unbelievable to cut something like that, yet yeah, alone moving it. And here we come to an end. Um, this is uh, one of the astronauts. Uh, we'll be here and talk in a minute. And on this video here, just click there. There. Looking at it, they're busy. I uh, have been busy studying this, that's true. I have no doubt that extraterrestrials could very well have populated or made structures on the far side of the moon. He's one of the Apollo astronauts, uh, one of the few that come forward to say something. This is a uh, conviction again, and this is the involvement with the CIA. You can see there's a report around the house, and uh, his son threatens the reporter with the CIA. Don't get that gun, shoot them out before they get out of the house. We have a video camera running if you want to do it. Right. Uh, right that would be great footage for us. See you later. From Porto. Going to the CIA. Have a blast. I don't think he said waxed, I think he said whacked, like you know they do in America, get them whacked. Um, and then this guy is uh, obviously, he's just a, he's just a normal guy like, like, like myself, like all of us, that just wants to find answers and he actually pursued it. He, he, lived, he lived next door, close to NASA and he, he went after it, he wanted to find out the truth and this is what he had to say. We were escorted into, the, into this room and it's like five or six of these full-length tables turned out to be more than a thousand pictures. But the resolution was very high. And at that moment, the whole occasion <coughs> turned. It became almost solid. Because we knew what we were looking at, and we knew what it meant. There are structures there. There were pipelines. The bridges were clear as a bell. There was machinery, there were tank tracks, what would appear to be tank tracks. When I looked at those clear images, we knew that we were looking at uh, an existing, or at least an ancient technology. These things didn't grow, these things were manufactured, these things were built, and they were built on a huge scale. A massive scale that suggests a race of beings we might not be able to successfully confront, should we have to. And that reaches the end, so you can see uh, you have the testimonies of, of just a few of them demonstrated. There's so much information left out of this, it's unbelievable. And if you put it all in, we'd be here for weeks looking at it all. But I've just managed to get some of the important bits, but there's more and more people that were in high positions that are coming forward that are telling people what's actually happened. So, like in the beginning, what one of the guys said, we will have to rewrite the whole of human history once it all comes out. And it's going to cripple some establishments when they do that, which is why it's taking so long. So, thank you for coming. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you.